All right, in this video, we're going to talk about deploying applications to AWS's Fargate service, which is a way of taking, in this case, a Docker container and having Amazon essentially build the infrastructure and then hosting the content for you. Um, there's a lot of different sort of individual steps to this process, um, a lot of gotchas, and the hope of this video is that it's going to sort of step us through um, from start to finish, then even tearing down what we built so that you're able to get up to speed quickly. Um, that said though, this video won't be able to cover everything and so I highly encourage you as you're sort of exploring on your own to take what you have learned here as a base to then explore on your own. Um, as long as you're sort of tearing down the items that you've created, you really generally don't have to worry about crazy AWS bills. Um, and as long as you're sort of taking the time to carefully note down what you've done, you should be able to sort of weave your way into sort of modifications to this process as well. So definitely encourage experimentation, uh, but just note that at least in this video, the hope is that you'll be able to go from start to finish. So um, the point of this then, of course, is to publish a Docker container into uh, uh, the Elastic Container Registry, and then we're going to build the infrastructure in AWS to pull that container and then serve it as a, a website. So this, of course, does start with a container and that's sort of out, out, outside of the scope to some degree of this video, but um, the sort of perhaps easiest way to describe this process would be to build a basic application um, using uh, Docker. And the way we do that is we uh, essentially download Docker from the internet and I uh, use Docker Desktop, so I kind of drug the little icon in right here. And Docker Desktop um, is going to provide a program which will allow us to uh, experiment and sort of view repositories. But really all we're after in terms of this process here is just having Docker so that we can build the containers from scratch. And when we have that, and again, this is really outside the scope here because I want to get to the AWS part specifically, um, but really the, the process of building a Docker container is, is surprisingly simple. Um, so I have a project here, which I'm going to load up, and then also a series of commands. And this will give you a basic Docker container that you can use. So effectively, um, in, in this case, VS Code, I have created a folder um, which is just sitting on my, my desktop and it has the world's simplest sort of uh, Docker container. So um, within it, within this folder, um, I will create a folder called public-html and I will then create at the top level a file called Docker file. So there's no extension on this, it's just Docker file. Um, and then within the public HTML, I have a file called index.php and actually I want this to be index.html doesn't actually really matter in this case but uh, and then it just literally has a simple bit of HTML so if you were to visit this as a website you'd see the world uh, the, the string hello world printed on the page so this as a project has nothing to do with docker just yet um, there's no web server behind this it's just literally sort of a folder in two text files this text docker file index the power of this comes in when we actually then effectively use Docker, once we've installed it, to build this as a essentially a container. So the first thing that we do is to our Docker file, we're going to add this text right here. This is literally it. This just says we're going to grab uh, the HTTPD server, so the Apache web server, and then we're going to copy the contents from our public HTML folder into this uh, effectively a path that's going to be in our Docker container, so this user local Apache 2 htdocs. So there's a lot of conventions going on here. So there's a convention for how you pull, essentially a dependency for this container. There's a convention for how you actually get content, in this case, our hello world file into this. Ignore all of that if you don't care. Just really know that we just need these two lines right here. Uh, then once we have this, we will build this as a container. And this is where these uh, items right here come in. So in VS Code, you'll have a terminal that you can bring up. I believe it's under View uh, Terminal, if you don't have it. And then just run each one of these commands sequentially. I'm not going to do it right here because I already built it. But you're basically going to tell Builder to build a container called AWS Container Test. You're then going to tag it with um, the title. And then you're going to put in your um, AWS ID right here. And then your region. So again, there's a lot of sort of things that are sort of specific to the um, to the task at hand. The two that you care about are this bit 
and notice how it's kind of highlighting that right there and then this bit this us west too so to be clear this video does uh, expect a little bit of familiarity with the, the aws console and in this case this is the region that we're going to be publishing to so us west 2 you'll notice it's referenced in two places so this is quite literally just like a url to the container that we're going to push so we effectively tag this with the latest uh, tag and then we say this is where the container lives and so we're about to hop into aws but just kind of note here that these bits right here are the dynamic bits so you would be changing these uh, most likely to match yours though to be clear the only thing that would change would be this for sure so your essentially your amazon account number and then whatever region you're going to be in but i would highly suggest for this video just stay in us west 2 um, that way you don't have to change any of this so go to aws switch to us west 2 and then just note your account number and make sure that that is changed right there uh, but all this other stuff you can leave the same so aws container test um, and effectively what this is going to do then with the last command is you're going to push this repository up to Amazon. So um, their Elastic Container Registry, ECR, is now going to have effectively a file. So let's actually hop into AWS and just see there's one prerequisite here, which is that we do need to create that container registry first. So here now we are in Amazon and I have gone in for services to Elastic Container Service. And once I'm in Elastic Container Service here, and by the way, you just get this to directly from ECR, but just to kind of show you the context. Um, once you're in here, and Amazon's been loading a little bit slow today. There we go. We go into the side menu and we can go to Amazon ECR and the repositories. And you can see this repository name right here. So what I would do is I would say create a repository, create a private repository, and then just jot the name down that you want to use. And again, in my case, I'm using AWS Container Test. So I could literally just copy this and then that's what I would use for this right here. And then note then that this bit right here is effectively that full URL that we're using right here. Sort of bounce around, but it's effectively we're saying this URL is what we're generating in this process right here. Um, you'll notice here it's, it's saying this repository exists. That's fine. In your case, it probably won't. Um, but then just hit create repository. Then you'll have a place where you can put the container that you're about to build, and that place then will be um, this right here. And so that is sort of our prerequisite. Again, there's a lot going on here. I mean, it's Docker, it's um, it's Visual Studio Code. There's you know a lot you'll have to kind of do to make sure you get this set up properly. Um, but again, the actual project that we run here should be pretty simple. It's a couple files, a Docker file with some text in there, just kind of pause the video, copy and paste this in. And then right from your terminal, you can just run these commands to build the container, to tag it, and to push it up to your Amazon Web Services account. Uh, finally, there's one string that I may get back to here, but sort of one of the questions that comes up is, let's say you deploy an application and then you want to sort of push a new version of it out. This is the command that you can use for that. So effectively, um, you tell the Elastic Container Service to update it, you uh, tell it which cluster you want to update, this would be dynamic, and then uh, you force a new deployment. And so just want to kind of put this out there because this is something where, yay, you got the, the initial thing up and running, but this is, you know, in production, you need to know how to update it. And so it's nice to have that. So anyway, we're going to bounce these down though, and now we're just going to kind of focus on the Amazon side of this. So there are two main ways that we can publish to uh, uh, Amazon. The first way is really nice if you're kind of in the Windows world and you have Visual Studio uh, because they have a tool, the Amazon uh, Web Services Toolkit, that you can effectively add as an extension to Visual Studio and uh, just search for Amazon uh, Toolkit. And when you do that, it shows all the account items that you may have. So it'll show any clusters or repositories. Notice here's the repository. I just um, was looking at right here and they even have a nice way to just sort of publish a container to AWS um, and for the most part this works brilliantly um, the problem is is that there is a little bit of setup that we have to do first though to make sure that this this push actually works um, but it is really nice and handy if you're in the visual sort of studio world the other way that you can do it is with using the AWS console so right so the, the website and that's the way we're going to take in this video because it allows us to get a little bit more sort of hands-on with the process. Um, but there are, as mentioned at the top of the video, there's a few caveats with this as well. So if you use sort of like the default settings, some of the process won't work. And so that's what we'll cover in this. Um, so let's get started then. So first things first though, um, we do need to uh, create our networking setup. 
So to do that, we usually go into the VPC setup here. There's a couple, unfortunately, there's a couple places that we'll kind of web off as we're uh, doing this. Uh, specifically, we'll be in the EC2 console for things like our, our, um, our load balancer. But for the most part, this is where most of the items that sort of deal with your networking go in. So effectively what we're doing in these steps is we're gonna create the network that um, our Fargate instance is gonna use. And it starts with a VPC. So basically what I'm gonna do is, um, and just to note here, if you've used Amazon before, you may recognize some of these items. This account is pretty much bog standard. So if you signed up for AWS, this is what your account will look like. You'll have sort of like a default VPC, some of these items will also have some default uh, values. So subnets, you'll have some of these. Um, you'll have a default route table, right? So the areas that we're gonna touch in this, you'll see existing entries as we go through. But in my case, what I wanna do, and I would suggest you do this, do this too, is instead of using the default uh, VPC, I am gonna create a new one. And this one is gonna be specifically for running Fargate. So let's go ahead and create one. So I'm gonna call this Cluster VPC, and by the way, I do have autocorrect here, which keeps wanting to put this as VAC. So hopefully I won't <laughs> miss that too many times. Um, but yes, we're gonna call it something. Um, we're gonna add our CIDR block here, and in this case, um, this is gonna be our classes routing space. This is just going to be where we want our network to live. And in this case, we're gonna go 16 off 10 0, 0, 0, 0. And this is gonna allow us then to create two subnets off of this, which we'll do in just a second. But for now, just kind of know that this is, you know, usually use 172 or 10 dot. And so we're just kind of adding this sort of uh, classes uh, network space. So I'm gonna click create VPC and not much else that we need to do here. Of course, add tags if you want about like, you know, when you added this, who did it. In this case, it's just for a test. So we'll just go ahead and create it. So the next thing that we need to do is just take note now of the fact that we've created this VPC. Notice it starts with OF right here. And that's just sort of handy to know sometimes. It uh, does create a little name for you here when you use this uh, system, but a lot of times when you're sort of bouncing around in these other items and tasks, it's just kind of handy to know what the VPC is like first few letters here. So just kind of note it's OF um, 06 BC. But for our case, we only have two. so. You know, just seeing it's OF, it's not gonna be zero, zero, so that's our cluster VPC. Um, so the one thing that we will note now is um, that under security groups here, this has now created a new entry for us. And again, this is where knowing the sort of VPC name is handy here, because here we have two. This is the one that's created with my Amazon account, but the one that we just created is right here. And we know that because the VPC ID is once again OF right here. So effectively what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that this um, VPC can serve traffic to our clusters um, and then specifically to the load balancer that we're gonna create as well. Now, typically speaking, this is a huge topic, security, and this is something you wanna take very, very cautiously. We're gonna be very judicious in this video um, in that we're not gonna be creating specific security groups for a load balancer and we're not gonna be sort of hiding this from the public, like everything's just gonna be open. Um, but when you're done creating this cluster, that is really the first thing you do is you would start going in and adding um, uh, restrictive rules so that only, for example, your load balancer can talk to this. Um, and then your load balancer through your CDN can only be communicated through that channel. And so you will absolutely go in after this and, and add some more rules. But for us right now, we're gonna be very judicious. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're just gonna make sure that everything can talk to this VPC. And we're gonna do that by just adding an all traffic rule to that VPC's uh, security group. So again, OF, this is the VPC the security group's attached to. We're gonna edit the inbound rules and we're just gonna say add a rule to allow all traffic from anywhere. And just save that rule. And that way we don't have to worry about um, any uh, actions being blocked to this. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna enable for the security group, um, uh, or for the VPC, we're going to enable uh, a feature here uh, called DNS host names. And this is something that may help with the newer versions of the Fargate uh, platform, in this case 1.4. Um, but uh, we're gonna enable that right there. Um, and then we're going to uh, go in and create our subnets. So now that we have a VPC set up, our Fargate instance sort of behind the scenes needs to be able to reach out of um, its 
network and do things like pull your container. And we do that using subnets. We're essentially creating a network layer on top of our VPC. And the subnets that we're gonna create um, are done so right here. So we'll go to subnets, we're gonna create a subnet. We're gonna select the VPC that we just created, so cluster VPC. And then I'm just gonna call this public subnet one. And the availability zone, this is um, gonna be very critical for our load balancer. Um, we're gonna create two subnets and they need to have different availability zones. So the first one's gonna be US West 2A and we're gonna put this at 10.0.1.0 slash 24. We're gonna add a second subnet. This one's gonna be public subnet two. The availability zone is gonna be different. We use 2A in the first one, here we use 2B. And this one is gonna live at 10.0.2.0 slash 24. So effectively we're creating two networks. They each have 255 um, addresses available to them. One's uh, gonna be uh, 10.0, so you'd have like up through 254 here. And then this would be .2 dot up to 254. So we're going to create those subnets. And now we have these um, public sub subnets listed. Now you'll notice that after we create these, it does sort of filter based on these two, but it is important to note that if we just click subnets again, we're now gonna see um, multiple subnets. So um, these are the two we just created, but these four right here were the ones that already existed. So it is important to note here that, um, again, as you start getting in here and your, your setup may be a lot more complicated or have more entries, but that is one of the, for me at least, sort of tough things is just remembering where everything was. But this is why sort of you'll get some names here. You can edit these at any time. And then again, knowing that VPC name, this OF again, you can see here that just by glancing that, oh yeah, these are the two uh, VPCs that are affected by this. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that each one of these uh, subnets is public. So by checking this box uh, on the two subnets that we created one at a time, I'm just gonna go to actions. I'm gonna say model, modify auto assign IP settings and I'm just gonna say assign public IP4 address. And again, this is important for Fargate's ability for these uh, for your network to effectively reach into the um, uh, uh, other parts of the network to do things like grab your container. So we're gonna save that. So now both of these are public uh, subnets. You'll actually see this by auto assign public IP4 address right here. And you can see now that um, those both have that. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create an internet gateway. So um, effectively, we've created these subnets. We have rules that allow them to reach out, but they don't actually have internet access yet. And so for that, we're actually gonna create an internet gateway. So um, there are, by default, no gateways created when you create a VPC. And so if you're like me here with a fresh account, we won't actually have any um, items in here. And so we're just gonna go ahead and create an internet gateway. It's a pretty simple process. It's just access um, SS2 name it. And there's nothing else we can do right here. So we'll create the internet gateway, but then we just want to make sure that under internet gateways, we attach it to the VPC we created before. So notice here, it's sort of like, yes is the one we just created, but then under actions, attach to VPC. And it just asks us to select the VPC again, in this case known as OF, but it does kind of tag it with a little name right here. So cluster VPC and we'll attach the internet gateway. Next thing that we need to do is we need to uh, select our route table for the VPC we just created and make sure it can communicate with our internet gateway. So once again, here's our VPC, so this OF. Effectively what I do is I'm gonna select this route table right here and I'm gonna go into routes. And I'm gonna add a route by clicking edit route For 000 for our internet gateway. And so it's going to select this internet gateway we just created, so this 064. In this case, there was only one. I've noticed the UI is a little bit wonky on this sometimes, where it seems to like flash and it did some weird stuff before. So you may get that too, but effectively, we've only created one internet gateway, so it just is effectively selecting that for us. And we're going to go ahead and save changes. And what this is going to make sure then is that we can go from our internet gateway to our VPC appropriately. 
And that should hopefully be it as far as net rating goes. Again, we stayed mostly within the uh, VPC space right here, the, um, the control panel. And just as kind of a quick recap, we created the VPC, and we noted its name. We then went in and we did things like enabled uh, DNS host names. We uh, created two subnets. We made sure both of those subnets were public by selecting and saying modify auto assign IP settings. We created an internet gateway, which in this case was that 064. And then we made sure that we could route from the gateway to our VPC or the VPC had a, a route from it. And so we added it just like this. And so now we're effectively ready to get into the Fargate process, but there's one last thing that we need to do, and that is permissions. And again, this is one of those areas where unfortunately it, it can be a little bit smoother. So anyway, I'm gonna go into services and we're gonna go to our roles here. So I am roles, and I'm going to uh, select roles right here. So my account, again, very, very simplistic. And I'll probably do have a few more than a new role would have. But there's effectively two roles that we're going to need to create right here so that we can build our cluster appropriately. So, and I've actually kind of mixed these into one, which I call container role right here. But effectively what we need to do is we need to create a task execution role that is going to allow Fargate to go in and effectively uh, create and run tasks for us. And so if I select this uh, task right here role, you're going to notice it has two policies. So container registry read only and CloudWatch logs full access. So effectively what you're going to do is if you don't have this yet and you won't by default, and I've seen mixed, um, mixed uh, results on the process that we're about to do next creating these for us. So therefore I usually just create these manually and then I, I just select these as the roles that I want to use. But effectively if you don't have this um, already, um, what we do is you go into roles and you would create a new role and you would create an elastic container registry role or unless a container service, and then you'd select this top item right here, and then you'd add permissions to it, and by permissions, you would effectively just um, take this existing role here and say yes, you'd add tags, and then you review and you create that role. And then when it's done being created, then you're actually gonna go into the role that was just created, and you're gonna modify it. So in my case, um, I modified the role to call it the ECS task execution role. And then I just, I removed that first policy that was attached to it and I just added these two right here. So really just kind of pause the video and when you attach policies, you effectively just search for a name and then you just click the box and say attach policy. Um, the critical part to this though, is we do need to make one modification to this, which is the trust relationship it needs to be ECS-tasks. So if I go back out here, again, just kind of starting from the top, you go to roles, you select this ECS task execution role, you go to trust relationship, then you edit the trust relationship, and the service is ECS-tasks. When you do this, I think the first time, it'll just be ECS, but we just put in ECS-tasks. Then just go ahead and update the trust policy. So that's the first item that we're gonna create. And again, notice the two permissions, CloudWatch and EC2 uh, container registry read only. There's one other role which I've created which sort of molds those two into a few others that I care about. And it is a role called container role. So what I did is I created a role called container role and I essentially added these policies to it. So EC2 full access, I am full access, and then the rest of these guys right here. And then finally, under trust relationship, I did make sure that it was once again ECS tasks that I added. So personally, you know, both of these are gonna work. You're gonna see we're gonna use both of these in just a second. That is the container role and ECS task execution role. Um, and again, the critical thing to note here is that some of these um, providers will actually attempt to create this, specifically this task role right here for us. But I just had sort of mixed success in that where sometimes it doesn't seem like it's created properly. So I just like to create these IAM roles ahead of time so I don't have to worry about them later. But as long as we have that set up then, now we're ready to go into ECS, the Elastic Container Service. So there's a couple different things that we need to do here. The first is to just kind of know that at the very high level, effectively what we're doing is we're gonna create a task definition the task definition gets created um, as a template for a service and the service runs and uh, runs as a cluster. 
So you can actually see some of these terms right here. So we have clusters, test definitions. Um, the first thing that we want to do though is we do want to create our test definition. And so the test definition is going to be blank again. If you haven't done this before, you depending on your organization, you may actually have some rules in here. But effectively what the test definition is going to be doing is it's going to be telling the system what our effectively our container run test looks like. So we're going to select new, we're going to click Fargate, and we'll click next steps. The test definition is in this case going to be something uh, very generic. So I'm just going to say Fargate task. The task role, this is where we just came from, as you recall, is going to be in my case container role. So this role just needs to make sure it has permissions to do all the things that sort of Fargate does behind the scenes to, to effectively run this for us. So you can say container role, networking mode, you'll notice we can't change this right here. The task execution role is gonna be this ECS task execution role. So I'll go ahead and select that. For the sizes here, I'm gonna make these all the small, so just 0.5 and uh, 0.25. And then we get to our container. So this is the thing that we talked about before. So let's actually go back into ECS, and let's go to our repositories here, because we're going to need a URL in just a second. But effectively, what we're going to do here now is this is saying, okay, here is the name of a task. Here are some resources for the task. Here are some permissions for how we run it. But then I also need to essentially say, well, what container are you going to be running? So this is where the Docker part comes in. So effectively, I'm going to click Add Container. I'm going to give the container a name. So I'm just going to say Fargate Container. And you'll notice here my autocorrect once again tries to get me. Then it's going to ask us for a repository location. So this is where our first sort of uh, process came in. We need this right here. So we need the URI to our container. So I'm just literally going to copy this. So again, if you haven't built your repository already, just make sure you do that. I'm just going to copy that UI. I'm going to paste it in here. And I'm going to do one other thing, which is you'll notice here that in the sort of helper text, it says repository URL, the image, and then it's got this little colon and tag. Well, I'm going to say colon latest. And that's just going to make sure that when it pulls a container image from this, that it's always going to pull the latest container. And it kind of actually helps to see here that if I actually click on this repository name, it's going to show me the two images that are in here. And you're going to notice the tag for this one is latest. And it's got the URI, out, URI in a, 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 a SHA-2 digest. What's critical though is if I were to have um, previously pushed another container in here, you would see that the new container would get the latest tag and then the one that was old would just be now another item listed in here. And so this is kind of like a shortcut to just tell the service that you, when you sort of build this task, just always grab the latest version of this container. But you'll notice here in more advanced uh, workflows that you can actually change what that is. You can actually say, no, grab a different container using a different tag. But for us, though, we just want the latest. So everything else, you'll notice there's tons of things. We don't care about any of this. We're just going to say add. And we're going to scroll down and say create. So effectively, what we've done here is we've given the task a name. We selected that role that we created before for task role. For task execution, we kept it to ECS tasks. This is why, by the way, I would just create both. It certainly doesn't hurt. We've got it very small limits right here, though, of course, you can change these to be something bigger. But it's a test. We don't care. We selected the container, which really just meant giving it a name and then pointing to the URL of where it was. And that's it. We're just going to go ahead and create. It's not at this point now. Our task um, has been created. So if we go back now to our test definitions, you'll notice now that this has been created. So we have a task definition called Fargate task. And so that's pretty much all we need to do here now until we want to essentially uh, remove everything later on uh, uh, when we're sort of tearing everything down. So we're pretty much done here. So we have a test definition, essentially a blueprint for the thing that we're about to build. So now effectively what needs to happen is we just need to connect all these dots that we just created and spin up our Fargate instance. So to do that, I'm going to go and create a cluster. So if I go into ECS and I click cluster right here, you'll notice that there's no clusters. Uh, there's one thing about this process that I find um, sort of nicer in the new versions, which is you have this little toggle right here, this new ECS experience. Obviously, this will go away at some point. But if you're in the old ECS experience, I would highly recommend 
flipping this button right here so you get the new ECS experience. It's gonna make one task in particular easier. And when we do this, you'll notice the UI has changed, but the actual wizard that we're about to run is different as well. So to create our cluster, I'm just gonna say create cluster. We have three options here in this wizard. The first is networking only. This is the one that we care about. Though it is important to note there's sort of more advanced one right here where you actually use an Amazon machine image to kind of spin up a, a sort of a, a more full featured machine. In our case, all I care about is just the networking, right? I just need you to sort of, uh, by you I mean Fargate, to just kind of connect all these dots and just essentially launch my container. So I'll click next step. The cluster name then, I'm just gonna again call something very generic. And that's it, I'm just gonna say create. Now, there was this option right here to create a VPC. This, I have never gotten to work. Um, and so I just kind of leave this alone. We created the VPC already in the earlier step. So let's click create, and that's our cluster. So now I can click view cluster. You may get an error right here. I kind of notice there's like a raise condition where sometimes I kind of look for something that's not there. If you just refresh, it's fine. The other thing I'll notice that, uh, or notice what happened, you probably just did too, is when I refreshed or when I completed the, uh, the wizard and went to the old um, uh, interface. So by refreshing that, it went to the new one. So there's just little sort of things, bugs that you might see as you're going through this. But for now, what we care about is that we've created a cluster. So it's called a Fargate cluster. There's no services and no tasks running here. So that's our next step is we effectively now need to connect our task definition to this cluster. So to do that, I'm gonna click the Fargate cluster right here. And now I'm gonna click deploy. So you have a bunch of information that kind of showed it, you know, there's no nothing running in this cluster, so our overview is just kind of empty. Um, but what we're really after here is a service. So a cluster contains uh, two things mainly, but for our case right here, we only need to do the one, but it's gonna contain tasks and it's gonna contain services. So services are sort of like long running uh, items like a website, which we're trying to build right here, but a task would be something that is um, sort of shorter lived, but you'll notice it actually is gonna create both of these right here. So a task is gonna be like grab our container and the service is gonna be runner container. So you'll see both of these created, but what we care about is just the service. So I'm gonna click deploy, and now we go to another wizard here where we're effectively going to define um, all the bits that make up our Fargate container. We should almost now hopefully be almost done. So the first thing it's gonna do is um, it's gonna ask us what our compute configuration is. In my case, I'm gonna say launch type because I just want it to be Fargate and I just want it to use the latest platform. This I haven't actually experimented with a lot, but I know this is how you do uh, capacity and provisioning a little bit more advanced. In my case, I just say, nope, just Fargate launch type. For deployment configuration, we're gonna be deploying a service. So we'll leave that alone. For the task definition, this is the thing we created before, Fargate task. So effectively, this is the task definition. So it's gonna grab the Fargate task and the revision is gonna be the latest one. So the service name, again, we can call this pretty much anything you want. I'd be very, very careful about using names that are too long. So I have seen parts of this fail, specifically with the load balancer, if you try to use names that are too long. So be short if you can to avoid any sort of weird issues. For my service name, I'm just gonna say um, uh, Fargate task, actually Fargate service. Desire task is one, we'll leave that alone. Deployment options, there's a couple things in here. You can sometimes set this minimum to like 50. I'll just kind of leave it alone here. But I have noticed that if you use like the um, AWS toolkit, it actually sets that to 50 by default if you use the smallest. So, you know, something where it doesn't matter too much uh, if you're just doing tests, but sort of uh, your deployment capacity is something that is gonna affect your billing. So just kind of take note of that. Now, you don't have to use a load balancer, but I would highly suggest it. It costs about $1.50 a day, and if you're doing sort of like a real deployment, I absolutely would. And even if we're doing a test deployment here, because it, you get billed per day, um, this is gonna cost us about a cent to run this for the little time that we do this uh, system. But I would highly, highly recommend using the load balancer. To set up is very simple. We're just gonna create a new load balancer. The balancer is gonna be um, called something. I would again be very careful about your names here. Make sure it's no more than like 20 characters. Um, for the target group, target group, I'm just 
gonna call it something simple. Protocol is gonna be HTTP. Again, this is where if you wanna do um, uh, HTTPS termination, you could terminate here. We're actually um, in a real scenario gonna be probably terminating against a, um, a content uh, distribution network. So we'd actually be do TLS there, but here for right now, just to keep things simple, we'll do HTTP only. Though note that you could certainly terminate TLS uh, here as well. It's outside of the scope of this video though. Um, for networking, so we kind of, again, just to review, um, launch type Fargate, deployment service, Fargate task, Fargate service, load balancing, create a new one, call it Fargate load balancer, and just create one target group to HTTP. Now we get into networking. So this is where we're gonna kind of connect all those dots we created before. Now it does kind of helpfully go in, uh, at least sort of somewhat helpfully, and it tries to autofill this for us. But we are actually not using the default VPC, we're using the cluster VPC. So I'm actually gonna select that, and then it's gonna ask me to define the two subnets. I'm gonna select both of these guys right here. This is another area where I've unfortunately had no luck in the past, so, um, it seems nice to just say create a new security group, but this just fails for me every time I do it. Um, so I am going to use that existing security group that we created before, which auto populates to the security group that we created for this VPC. Um, finally, public IP, we're gonna leave this enabled. And now we're gonna click deploy. And by the way, big fingers crossed here because there's so much that can go wrong right here. Um, but hopefully if we've done all the other parts right, this should just work. So we're just gonna click deploy and it's going to sort of refresh the screen and pop this little window up right here. Now, that said, errors do happen. And I wanna talk about a few of the things that you can kind of check if this fails on us. So behind the scenes, this system right here is using a, a CloudFormation template. And this is really just a way of sort of um, using a script to build infrastructure up. So we can actually go into um, CloudFormation and we can actually see what's being run right now. So this is what's called a stack. So if I go into stacks right here, you can see that um, it is creating this stack for us. And so I believe this actually is old right here. So this is from before, I could actually just delete this one. But so here you can see, this is the stack that we're running right now. So 1332, it's 133 now. So it started this just a few seconds ago. So effectively what this is doing is it's running a series of scripts. So it's creating our um, our various bits and bobs, include the like, load balancer, and you just kind of see this as it's going through this process. So if this fails, this is where you'll actually see a um, sort of a note of that failure in this process. And so um, a good example of that, let me just kind of drag my screen in right here. So an earlier test, um, started creating much of infrastructure, but then there was a, um, a, a an error that happened. In this case, the large balancer, a low balancer target group was longer than 32 characters. And so the create failed. And then what's critical about this is because it failed, then it rolled back everything it created. So it removed the security group that it you know, was modifying, it removed the low balancer. If everything works here properly, there should be a nice sort of like cleanup operation that happens. So we're not left with a bunch of infrastructure that we don't need. Um, and so yeah, so pretty much what it's gonna be doing now is just creating the various uh, uh, components that the, um, the system needs to run. And so we'll probably pause here for just a moment as it finishes this up. Okay, so this is a good sort of, uh, this is, although I, I wish that it would have done, so I realized I missed a step right here. So yeah, so we did just fail right now. The create failed, you can see the message here is invalid request. The container Fargate container did not have a container port 80 defined. And I absolutely remember this now when I kind of thought about this for a second. But this is nice because it kind of tells us now where we effectively need to go back here. So what this is saying is that when we defined our container image, we didn't actually put a port number in. Um, but it is, again, nice to note here that the sort of um, CloudFormation stack will tell us that. Now, it is important to note here that um, I have had some uh, bad luck with essentially a, a deployment failing and then the cloud uh, formation stack itself causing 
are preventing a new deployment from working. So I'm gonna let this work for just a few more moments to make sure the rollback completes, but I am going to delete this CloudFormation stack before I attempt to recreate the service. And I would highly recommend that you do that as well because particularly with things like Load Balancer, it'll sometimes like stick on a name and it'll prevent it from working. So anyway, um, effectively what happened here is, um, you can see actually see this, um, uh, reflected right here as well, our, our same error message. Um, sometimes, by the way, these error messages are not very helpful, so that's why the call formation is nice. But effectively what it means is in my task definition here, I did not uh, define a port for my, um, for my container. So this, oh, I get cluster, Yeah, so I do not have a service. Put a task definition here. So I think I was hoping we could update it, but I don't know if that's actually gonna happen. So here's what we're actually gonna do. We're just gonna recreate that task definition. So let's create a new task definition, Fargate. And effectively, I'm gonna point out what I missed right away. We didn't have a port mapping right here, so I forgot to put an 80 right here. So we're gonna make sure we do that this time, but we'll just, to create, um, um, to make this a little bit simpler for us, we'll just call it task definition two container role, ECS task execution role, all that looks good. Again, select the two smallest amounts right here, but this time we'll make sure, um, we're just gonna call this something very obvious. And actually here we're gonna go into ECR, but leave that window open because we wanna just copy this quick. Tag it with latest and make sure we put in a port mapping this time. So this, um, you don't like to see errors happen like this, but if nothing else, this does kind of show that um, you can do things pretty far back in the process. They're going to cause the entire process to fail. And so um, this is a good, I suppose, if nothing else, a good lesson that um, you can always go back and fix these things. So in this case, we're gonna be creating a completely new test definition, and we're gonna use that instead of the one that we had before. So we go to test definitions, you notice here that we have this Fargate task. So I'm gonna click on this, and then, oh, so let me actually go back. So to delete a test definition, you have to click into the task, you select the revisions, and then you say deregister and this effectively is going to remove it for us. So task definition two is the only one that remains. This is the one that should now have the appropriate uh, setting for our container. So we should have port 80 mapped, which is what we want. So now we can go back to our cluster and we can give this a shot one more time. So again, you'll notice here, this interface gets a little bit wonky sometimes. So I had to kind of toggle back and forth to get the new version of this. And let's just try this one more time. So we'll go to task, test definition two. We'll go to launch type Fargate. Desire task one, networking. Let's do this again. Remember, it kind of selects the other VPC. We want these two subnets. We we'll use an existing security group. That looks good. And we want to make sure I want to make sure we got everything on here. I'm actually going to cancel this just for a second because I was not seeing load balancer on there for some reason. <laughs> so I don't know where that went. I may have just missed it there. It's 
So it actually seems to be disappearing when I select that. So we're actually going to try this again here. So somehow we are losing that item. Hopefully it doesn't keep. So we're going to select launch type Fargate. It's a service. Test definition to go ahead and select Fargate service. So now load balancer isn't disappearing us anymore. I don't know why that was happening. We're going to create a new load balancer. Oh, and this, so let's do this here. So back in cloud formation, rollback complete. So let's go back to our stack. We're just going to select it and say delete. So it takes a few moments for the delete to happen, but when it's done, we don't have to worry about that stack sort of interfering with this creation. And where I saw that specifically happen was um, when I tried to create the load balancer. And what it did was it said this name was already taken. All right, so we'll do this. We'll select HTTP for networking. We'll do this one last time. So cluster VPC, select the two subnets use the existing security group, and now we should be ready to deploy. We'll just check all this over one more time. So launch type is Fargate. Compute configuration looks good. Deployment is a service. Stats is definition two. Load balancer is configured. Our names aren't crazy long and are gonna create errors. Um, and so just to be clear, I brought this up a few times, but so this target group name uh, in the previous error, it won't give you an error if you create an invalid target group name, but it'll certainly error out in the process. Um, but our VPC looks good, our subnets are selected, so now we'll try clicking deploy one more time here. So now we're gonna go through the same process, and again, we can go right back into CloudFormation. You can see here that it is updated with this new creation, so we can click in the stack name, we go to events, and once again, we can sort of watch this take place. So we'll pause it one more time, and hopefully this time we won't have any errors. All right, so good news, our creation is now complete, so the error that we had before um, was definitely resolved by setting that port 80. So now the sort of second fun part happens. And, and what I mean by that is the creation process for Fargate is, is done. So the infrastructure has been set up. But what we're really after, of course, is can we actually reach, in this case, the container, the website that we, that we deployed. And that's, that's where the tasks come in. And so we're going to find this out together in real time here. So effectively what's going to happen now is back in container service, you can see here that I have, um, so we'll go back to the home page here. So we have our cluster, um, our Fargate cluster. And again, this is the container for essentially tasks, right? So the tasks are picked up and then run as a service. At least that's my understanding of it. So, so what's really, really important at this point is what is the task doing? and the task is running. This is the best possible thing that we could have seen. So the task is up and running. So this is effectively our website. So if we go back to services here, you'll see that we have this Fargate service, but it's, again, it's just saying, what task am I supposed to be running? Like I'm responsible for making sure the task is going. So, so the task, as it's running status, shows right here, is great. Now it is important to note that if I click into tasks, um, you can see here, um, sometimes you'll get logs. So um, you'll, not always, but sometimes you'll actually have, in this case, it's a, it's a Microsoft app. So you'll actually see that I've got some uh, uh, items here for, in this case, it looks like XML configurations, storing keys, blah, blah, blah. So, so you will get some, some tasks on here. And then you'll also have um, uh, some other information. Let me actually back here. Um, if the task didn't run, you would see a description that said why the task didn't actually start. So it is important to note that this sort of, if something failed in this process, there are a few things you can do to try to get more information about that failed process. And usually the, again, the task list is the best place for it. The other thing that is sort of interesting is how do you actually start and stop these tasks? Now, the whole point of a container running in Fargate is that it should be resilient and that it's really effectively hard to stop it. Um, and so one way that we certainly can stop a task though is we just select the task and we select stop. But what's interesting about this is the task, because it's being run by the service layer, will just try to be picked up and it'll try to run a new version of your task for you. 
And so the way we effectively stop everything from running is we would take our task, we would stop the task, then we go to our service, we would check this box next to the service name, and we would say edit, and then set the desired task to zero, and then update it. And this will effectively shut your service down, right? You won't get your, your site anymore. Of course, that does beg the question though, um, which is, well, how do I actually get to this site? So where does this live on the internet? Well, we did set up a load balancer for this service. And so the load balancer is a good place to go for that. And so to find that out, we'll go into EC2, which is where load balancers live. And under load balancing, I can select load balancers. And sure enough, I'll now see my Fargate load balancer. And this then is where my site lives. So if I copy this, I should be able to paste that into a browser and I should bring up my website. But at this point, um, it's probably not gonna work because there's one last step here now as it relates to security. And again, I mentioned this at the top that this is something that um, is gonna be highly dependent. It it's gonna be the first thing you wanna do, of course, once you're done, but it's gonna be highly dependent on how you run your network as to how this all runs. But effectively what's happening here is you'll notice it kind of starts loading the site, but it, it never actually finds it. So effectively, this URL is is known. It's a, it's a place where we can go, but it is not reachable. So why isn't it reachable? Well, it turns out, and I'm just assuming here, we'll find out in a second, but it turns out what's probably happening here is our our security group is not allowing traffic from our load balancer to our, our container. And the way we can find that out is we go back into VPC. So let's um, leave this up right here. We'll go out of CloudFormation and we'll go back into VPC. And we can look at our VPCs. And you can see here that I have again this OF and I can look at my security groups. And sure enough, here's that OF security group. And if I can select that, Oh, actually, this looks good to me. You can see here that we actually are allowing all traffic in on this security group right now. So actually, this is not quite what I thought it was going to be uh, in that we did allow all traffic in from uh, or, or in this in this VPC. Um, but you can see here it's not uh, reachable. So the other kind of thing that we can do, and this is where the Visual Studio Toolkit really comes in handy, is it sort of grab some of this information from various places and it makes it a little bit easier to get at. So in this case, I can go to my cluster, my Fargate cluster here, and when I click on it, it'll show the uh, URL to it. And actually it is running there, so I think I actually know what's going on here. So I think my load balancer, that's actually kind of interesting. Oh, and actually what was going on there? My apologies there, Fargate load balancer. So we're just gonna try something here quick. So actually this is the same, I think actually this is a little bit of a gotcha right here, is that it doesn't like these all upper cases. So I bet you if I change this to this, this is gonna work, and it does. So here's, here's another classic gotcha. So it looks like Amazon is telling us, so let's go back out here, that the DNS name for this guy's Fargate uh, load balancer, um, but it actually is not reachable from here. <laughs> and I actually don't know why that is. So we know that the, the case name, or these names are probably case sensitive, but actually this is kind of somewhat puzzling to me that this just simply doesn't work, whereas it should have, right? So I should be able to just pop that into my web browser and I should be able to reach that. Um, and actually now it does, but it's a lowercase. Hold on. It's actually, we've got a virtual machine here. So that's interesting. So it, is now redirecting. So you know what? This is one of those classic things where I don't quite know what's actually happening here. Um, but somehow in the sort of initial version of this, 
and now it's redirecting and I don't know why it's doing that. So I wish I understood this, but, but this is one of those things where if nothing else, um, this Visual Studio Toolkit right here really comes in handy um, because it is um, giving us a correct URL straight away or at least the URL that seems to work every time. Um, the other thing that this will do is um, you kind of see or this helps us understand the sort of um, the breakdown be between services and tasks. So the service, it gives us our sort of load balanced URL right here where we kind of reach this. But then for the task, it'll actually give us the task URL right here. And so this is probably not reachable. It might be public. Yeah, okay, it's, it's public right now. But effectively, this is our literal container running right here. So this 5241166.81, this is where on the internet, the container is actually running. And so one of the things um, to sort of close this out then, one of the things that you would probably want to do is you'd want to make sure that these containers are not actually routable. Um, so like, in other words, this 54 cannot just bring up our container, that the only way you could actually reach it is through the load balancer. And to do that, would be something along the lines of going back into our security groups and grabbing our load balancer and creating a security group for the load balancer and then attaching that security group to uh, this um, the security group right here and then making sure that all traffic is blocked. So in other words, you would have two rules, you'd have the security group itself and you have a second rule that says the load balancer security group is the only thing that can reach this. So that you can't just have random users typing in the direct IP address to your container. Um, and of course you would extend that logic one further out if you're using a, um, a, a caching server in front of this. Um, so CloudFront, for example, using a CDN, you would then effectively block both the containers and the load balancer from the internet, and the distribution network would be the only thing that could reach it again. Outside the scope of this, but just to kind of give some ideas of where you can kind of go next and some of the things that you can do. So last thing I'll just real quick sort of mention as we get out of here is that the method that we used in this video was to use the uh, the console's ECS um, uh, uh, wizard, basically. So create cluster and then create a service on that cluster. It is important to note that um, this method right here in Visual Studio is, especially if you're doing .NET work, uh, .NET Core work, is, is just simply easier. So the way this system works is you right click on your project. As long as you've um, enabled Docker support in your project, and as long as you have the AWS toolkit, you'll just say publish container to AWS. And it will then take you through this very simple wizard right here that sort of automates all the tasks that we did before. So you point it to a Docker repository, you create a new cluster or use an existing one. So it's, it's just sort of all the tasks we did before, but I just think in a uh, sort of an easier format. But even that said though, even with this, this um, wizard right here, which I think is generally easier and certainly easier because it makes updating uh, projects very simple, you still need to get the, uh, the VPC set up correct. And so hopefully, if nothing else in the first part of this video, that's been sort of something you're able to kind of grab onto. So that is it for this. Again, it's an hour long video here to sort of describe this process, but hopefully by watching this and following it, you're able to sort of get a containerized uh, Fargate deployment up and running, and you're able to get uh, your, your network in sort of a, a good place to sort of then start securing it. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what everybody thinks, questions, comments in the, uh, uh, the spot below, and, and good luck out there as you uh, publish containerized services at the front.